Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, joining us bright and early. I hope uh, you've had at least your first round of caffeine, if not more already. Um, welcome. This session is about getting started with streaming data. Uh, my name's Adi, and I run product for Amazon Kinesis, which is Amazon Web Services streaming data platform. And I'm very, very glad that we have with us today uh, Rick McFarland, who is a VP and the chief data scientist at Hearst Corporation. So I am just the opening act, uh, and the headline today is going to be Rick and all the great work that he's done. Uh, so what we'll do today is I will try and cover off some key streaming data scenarios for all of you. Uh, by way of a, of a quick poll, and I know some of you are still streaming in, uh, no pun intended, uh, how many of you uh, would say today have performed some sort of streaming data processing in their businesses or organizations? Well, that's a, that's a pretty uh, healthy number for, uh, for this sample set. All right, uh, so, so hopefully what you'll take away from the talk today, uh, at least from my section, is going to be uh, what, how to think about Kinesis Streams and Kinesis Firehose, and we have some exciting announcements coming today later in the keynote about uh, new features and enhancements that we built to the services. Uh, but really, uh, we will take a little bit more time getting into Firehose, uh, which is a service we initially launched at reInvent of last year. And uh, to really enable customers to capture and load streaming data into destinations like S3 and Redshift for downstream processing. And once I go through uh, the first half of the stuff, I'll hand over to Rick, who will then give you uh, an expert and a practitioner's view of what does it mean to design, deploy, and manage enterprise-grade uh, streaming data and big data infrastructures. So Amazon Kinesis is actually three services. The first service that we launched uh, back in reInvent 2013 is called Amazon Kinesis Streams. Think of it as a primitive or a building block that enables developers to, to, to have complete control and flexibility on how to capture and build their own custom stream processing applications using the tools of choice. All of our experiences there led us to release Kinesis Firehose, uh, which was this past reInvent, which is really tailored towards making the task of capture and delivery of streaming data into destinations like S3 and Redshift ultra simple. We also announced the third key service in the Amazon Kinesis platform, and that's Amazon Kinesis Analytics, which is a stream processing counterpart to Kinesis Streams and Firehose that enables all customers to express their stream processing applications in SQL. The focus of this talk however, is going to be Kinesis Firehose for today. Please note that Kinesis Analytics is still in preview phase. You can go up to the site and sign up, and we will enable access uh, down the line. So for several of you who are already practicing streaming data, this might be a bit of an academic slide. But I want to share this with you to build context about the streaming data journey that we've seen customers go through now that we've had these services in market uh, for three plus years. Now agnostic of the kind of data that you're dealing with, we've seen this three-phase approach to how customers have engaged and dealt with streaming data. The very first scenario, and this is common across industry verticals, is the notion of accelerated ingestion with minor to major transformation and loading of that data into existing data stores or analytical systems. It can take a variety of forms depending on which industry segment or industry vertical you might belong to. And here are a few examples. So if you're in the digital marketing or the ad tech space, uh, you might want to capture publisher data or bidder data and then capture that stream data and load it perhaps into, uh, into something like Amazon S3 and to keep that durably persisted for as long as you need to. If you are in the IoT space, 
Perhaps you want to capture all the individual events that your sensors or devices have been emanating and then capture and perhaps persist them into, a, uh, into an easily searchable destination like Elasticsearch. If you are in the gaming vertical, then you want to capture your customer's engagement and click stream and tap stream data as they engage with your mobile gaming assets to understand uh, perhaps down the line what it is and how it is that they engage with your asset. Once the ability to easily capture and load streaming data has been accomplished, what we've noticed immediately is the desire to do something else. And that something else is typically generating metrics, key performance indicators, or some such other, uh, uh, some such other derived values, derived statistics off the raw data that is being computed. And again, there are several examples depending on whichever industry segment you might belong to, but conceptually, it's the same thing. The same, by the same thing, I mean the desire to go from a raw, from a raw event stream into something that is suitable for you to engage in counting. Ultimately, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of aggregates and counts that are generated off that streaming data. Stage three, if you will, in the maturity model of streaming data processing is when this real-time stream data has not only been persisted, has not only had metrics extracted from it, but is now being manifest into the business systems, into the technology infrastructure such that it can provide a feedback to help improve, let's say, the customer experience. So an example in, uh, uh, in gaming might be that you've got your customer engaging with your mobile game, and based on how you see them succeeding or failing in any given level, having the ability to give them feedback, have the ability to perhaps pop up a, uh, a free gift, pop up a, a way for them to break through if they're getting stuck in that level. Uh, if you are in the IoT space, you might use that data to build a predictive model on is it likely that sensors of this type are going to fail soon. So that's the, how that breaks down into your specific vertical or use case might vary, but the key takeaway here is that in this responsive data analytics world, your stream data is now not just a, used for BI, for reporting, not just used for long-term persistence and data science, but is now manifested operationally in the way your business operates. All of the core Kinesis services will share these properties in common. Traditionally, building your own streaming data infrastructure from scratch has been operationally complex and burdensome to deal with at scale. So the first order of business, and this is true of many AWS services, is that the core services need to be very, very simple to provision, deploy, scale, and manage. The next key property, and this is particularly true for services that are operating on data, is the ability to elastically scale in response to incoming events. And because we're dealing with streaming data, we want to make sure that the, if you will, the end-to-end -end latency with which we do something useful with that data is on the order of a few single-digit seconds. So when I, I realize that the notion of real-time latency might mean different things to different people, but in our world, uh, the, the, world the, the notion of real-time would be on the order of one second or two seconds or less, depending on, on how the infrastructure gets rolled out. So let's spend a couple of minutes talking about Kinesis Streams, which was a service that started all of this. Kinesis Streams is for developers to build your own custom stream processing applications. It has easy administration, and by which we mean the ability to create a scalable infrastructure that can capture and store your ordered streaming data reliably is completely in your control. You indicate to the service how much capacity you want, 
in terms of this unit of scale called a shard, and you can add or remove shards and add or remove capacity as a result of that. Once that infrastructure is created, which can be changed at any point during operation, and you put data into your stream, there are a world of technologies that you can use to build your own stream processing applications. As AWS, we have some. For example, the Kinesis Client Library is an open source library that developers can use to build their own stream processing applications. We also have managed services like Lambda that can consume from Kinesis streams without you as developers and architects having to build out any lower level platform code. Or you can use any variety of big data open source systems such as Spark, Storm, Spark Streaming, and so on to connect with Kinesis streams and roll out your own applications. And because you have a lot of control over how you partition data, how you scale your stream, and how you build your application, really the notion of, of cost come, becomes completely under control, uh, under your control, and we have built Kinesis streams to be a very low cost streaming data ingestion environment to build your own stream processing applications. A part of this control, a part of this flexibility comes from the, the variety of things that can put data into your streams and the variety of ways you can build data to consume from your streams. So putting or sending data into your streams can be accomplished through a variety of different technologies, ranging from the core AWS SDKs that we event uh, to a variety of open source and third party agents or modules, including Log4j, Flume, Fluentd, and more. On the flip side, where the, interest, where the interesting stuff happens, where you're building your applications, you can go down to the most primitive level. So call into the get APIs to retrieve your data, and, or you can use something like the Kinesis Client Library that'll make the task of writing your own at least once stream processing application a little easier. Or you could use something like Lambda, a more event-driven model where your code, where your function gets triggered or fired each time data is put into the Kinesis stream. Or you could use uh, some of the most uh, richer frameworks like Spark, Spark Streaming, and Storm, either running on your own infrastructure, on EC2, or by using uh, Amazon EMR as a cluster infrastructure management tool to run your frameworks in. So when you put data into a Kinesis stream, each put gets automatically replicated across three availability zones. So the notion of durability comes from the fact that we're able to drive that three-way replication by default. There is no other state management, no other distributed coordination service, no other leader election algorithm. And I'm saying these things because as developers and architects, very often we have to wrestle with those kinds of fundamental uh, portions of the infrastructure and to design for scale and to design for reliability. And some of those tougher operational tasks, which become harder at scale, are what Kinesis Streams manages on your behalf. As you put data, the data gets emitted as an ordered stream of events for you to then apply your business logic under whatever specific application framework for yourself. And so of the same stream of data, you can build multiple consuming applications that are mutually independent, have, may have nothing to do with each other, and they can each be consuming independently from their stream to drive for their outcome. And that, in essence, is the hallmark of Kinesis Streams. Multiple producers that can feed multiple consuming applications, each of which is independently but concurrently processing the stream ordered stream of data. So some of the new things that we've introduced uh, over the last six months uh, include a brand new API for high scale. Uh, we've introduced a producer library that you can, as developers and architects, build into your applications that are sending data and it wraps up all the APIs in an elegant fashion to get you to a high throughput system. 
while minimizing the work that you have to do in writing very low level code. We've included new features like server side timestamps. Now each record that is ingested into the stream has embedded within it an approximate arrival timestamp, something that you can then use to build your time windowed applications. And all data stored in the Kinesis stream is available for 24 hours. But with a single API call, you can change that to up to seven day in, in day, day increments. So maybe you're stepping into a big launch and, uh, you, and it's also a three day weekend and you wanna make sure that in case there is an operational event, you need to have the data available, then you can simply turn that API on. And after four days, once everybody's back and the risk has been minimized, you can turn it back to its default 24 hours. And some other interesting use cases happen as a result because now the data is persisted for up to seven days, which means you, instead of merely looking at it as an operational event tool uh, feature, you can start doing interesting things with an ordered event stream that is up to seven days old. So now I'm gonna skip to our other service. So we, so far we spoke about streams, uh, lower level primitive, uh, where you have complete control and flexibility to build your streaming data pipeline. So the number one thing we learned with Kinesis Streams is that the canonical use case for streaming data in a massive stroke of irony is to batch it and then load it into a persistent store. Um, now in true Amazon fashion, you know, the experience that we, when we heard customers build was that we do that time and time again, and if I'm not, if I don't desire an absolute real-time processing infrastructure. And what I care about is using my existing tools, my existing BI tools, my existing analytical tools that either feed from S3 or connect into Redshift. Why don't you make my life easier? And thus, Firehose was spawned. It is a fully managed service uh, to capture and load these streams of data into destinations like S3 and Redshift and in the future, there will be other destinations that we'll support. So unlike Kinesis Streams, you don't build an application and you don't manage the notion of a stream or a shard. You don't scale the stream up or down. All of those elements are completely managed and you interact with the service through the console or through a simple set of APIs and have configurations to instruct the service to do things like batch your data, apply a compression algorithm on the data, uh, provide encryption using KMS, and then load the data into things like S3 and Redshift. That entire pipeline scales elastically based on your incoming workload. So it's a, as close to a zero touch platform uh, as, as, as we can get when it comes to dealing with streaming data. Much like with Kinesis Streams, there are a variety of ways to put data into Firehose. Here are a few examples. All of our AWS SDKs uh, obviously support Firehose APIs. Uh, we've got an agent uh, that is that you can do a pseudo YAM install right now because it's available in all uh, Amazon uh, Linux images, uh, based EC2 instances. Uh, and you can start sending data from, let's say, if those instances comprise your front-end fleet or a proxy fleet to send that file-oriented data into Kinesis Firehose today. And it also has a number of cool features like doing transformations to convert to flatten JSON, convert into JSON, which can then make loads into Redshift a little easier. Uh, so it's a fully managed service, completely elastic, and uh, the cost is three and a half cents per gigabyte of data transferred into that destination. So, Remember, we went through this slide in some detail, and, and what we learned was how the, the canonical use case for streaming data was this capture load into my destination. And that use case is exactly what Firehose intends to solve. So regardless, so regardless of kind of data source, if you intend to capture and store your data into something like S3 and Redshift, then Kinesis Firehose uh, is a great way to get started on that journey. 
Let's look at the, the customer experience really quick. Uh, very simple concepts. Uh, as I said earlier, you're not going to write any custom code using any framework, um, which means the only thing you need to know is that there is a notion of a delivery stream whose uh, job in life is to capture that data and deliver it. There are records. This is the event or the raw data that you put into that fire hose. And then the data producer, which could be uh, which, is, which is the entity that is generating that data. This could be your application running on EC2, it could be a smartphone app, it could be a sensor, a device, so on and so forth. So data producers, of which there are many and numerous, will send records into a delivery stream whose job in life is to do a best practices load into the specified destination that you've configured. Okay, so... In the console today, if you, go, if you log in, if you've never used streams or firehose, you get presented with these options. You pick something like firehose, and the first thing you'll do is, hey, where do you want the data to go? And you can pick, I want S3 or I want Redshift. You say S3, you give your stream a name, uh, and you, you instruct to it which bucket that you want your data delivered into, and optionally you can specify a prefix that you can then rely on for downstream processing. You hit next. Uh, you get some other options uh, that you can optionally configure. These include setting the buffer size in megabytes, setting a buffer interval optionally, which is how, how long do you want for Firehose to buffer your data before it emits it into S3 or, or instantiates a copy into Redshift. Uh, you can optionally also apply compression and encryption. And of course, uh, as with all things on, the, on AWS, IAM is kind of the the important currency by which you grant and revoke permissions for services to operate within your security context. Redshift operates in a similar fashion in that Firehose will first emit or stage the data in your S3 bucket. And that's generally a good idea because a number of things could be happening inside of your Redshift cluster and you want for all of your data to always be safe and durably stored. In the event that there is, for whatever reason, your Redshift cluster being overloaded, maybe there's a rogue query, uh, maybe, you've, uh, maybe it's under provision at that point in time, you want peace of mind that the data always exists inside of S3. Additionally, what we've noticed is that Redshift can be used for several wonderful use cases, uh, but a variety of other uh, tooling and applications might be using S3 as its durable persistent store. So in this scenario, you, uh, you provide the S3 bucket that Firehose emits data into, and then there, and you provide the Redshift cluster details. And the key thing here is that Firehose is executing a copy command that you provide. So using things like the agent, you can get the data to a relatively clean state, but then right after that, it is your copy command that Firehose will execute in a best practices manner to load the data into your Redshift cluster, including doing things like retrying, uh, setting error notification and logging, and a number of other features to make sure that that headache is what Firehose takes care of. So I, I spoke to you a little bit about, um, about the agent, uh, and I won't go into many details. Uh, it is software pre-installed, the source is available as well, it behaves like many other agents do, which is to make the task of capture and sending, buffering and sending data, including doing transformations, uh, format conversion, and log parsing easier on the box before it's sent. And that's super helpful when you're loading data into more structured, if you will, data analytics destinations like Redshift. Again, there's a simple pay-as-you-go pricing, which is three and a half cents per gigabyte. And then for those of you who are wondering, should I use streams or firehose before I hand it off to Rick? Um, if you're looking to build custom stream processing applications when you care about real-timeness, you start with Kinesis Streams. If you are looking to only really capture and deliver your stream data into those destinations, start with firehose. And there are a number of good reasons to use them together for their specific use cases uh, that Rick will now highlight. And just, I'll just leave you with one last thing. Uh, Kinesis Analytics, as I mentioned before, 
is a stream processing service. While it's not generally available yet, you can sign up for it and we're opening up preview and think about it as yet another consuming application, except that instead of learning new programming languages, new frameworks, and then managing them, it uses SQL. So now, finally, I want to hand this off uh, to Rick, who is the VP and Chief Data Scientist at Hearst Corporation. Uh, <coughs> he has over 25 years of experience in the data space, uh, both from an academic perspective and from building, designing, and managing enterprise-wide uh, data systems. So I can't think of a better person to share his industry perspective as well as how he has built and designed Hearst's uh, big data systems, especially to deal with clickstream analytics. Thanks, Adi. Hello. Thank you, Adi. Thanks, AWS, for having me. Um, I'm going to talk to you today on a more practical level on how at Hearst we actually used all the stuff, uh, the Kinesis stream and all of the uh, AWS uh, offerings to actually build a data stream as well as a product. I'm gonna share with you a product. Uh, I'm gonna kind of walk through the pipeline development that we did. Uh, and as I do that, I'll share with you lessons learned. Those of you that are trying to do this yourselves, uh, I wanna be able to see if there's any tips I can provide to maybe accelerate your process through that. And then uh, if we have any time at the end, we'll do, we'll do some questions. Um, and uh, to keep track of time here, I, I do have a couple of preamble slides. Uh, I know we've mentioned a lot about Clickstream, but I do think uh, it's important to uh, kind of ground the conversation around why is Clickstream important? Why do we care about it? Why is Hearst looking at it? Um, the way I look at the Clickstream is it's really about chasing the customer. Um, and I started, as, we, as Adi mentioned a long time ago, and when I started, the customer data that we had was collected through a survey. How, how many of you remember surveys? <laughs> um, you would get the disks once a week or once a month, and you would load that customer survey into your computer and do some analysis on it, right? Um, so fast forward a few years, uh, in the 2000s, we began to start to look at clickstream data or web data. A lot of the data that we used to follow the customer, they, they all migrated online. So we started tracking data uh, through online behaviors, through companies like Omniture or Google Analytics, or if you have your own, if you have your own uh, data collection process. Uh, but now we've now migrated into actually a world where now every device, I see everybody has maybe a laptop and a computer here with them. Uh, maybe even some of you have Apple Watches. All these devices are distributing information about your customers. And each one of these devices provide data back if you know how to gather it. And the challenge we have at Hearst is really what I think around reassembling the customer. How do I put them back together now that I have all these different devices uh, that they're using. And maybe uh, when will it stop? What's the future? Uh, it may actually be thought stream data. Um, there's a study about uh, in Australia where a person had some wiring on their heads and there was another guy in, uh, in London and uh, the guy in Australia thought lift your right hand and the guy in London lifted his right hand, arm. So there is, there is potential for maybe transmitting thought data. What will that look like? I don't know. Um, so anyway, in the context of this discussion and, and what the way I view Hearst's clickstream data is really the real-time transmission and collection of data that actually allows me to get as close to the customer as I can with as much information about the customer as I can get. And I need to be able to stream this massive information back to my uh, warehouse and then build products off of it. Good? So I like to start, uh, before I get really into the, the warehouse and how we built the pipeline, uh, asking the question of how many people have ever heard of Hearst? How about the company Hearst? I have a joke, my dad thinks it's Hearst. He forgets the T. Um, well, that's pretty good. A lot of people have not heard of us, but uh, we're actually a, a very large media company, and we have 
uh, 20, nearly 20 magazines uh, in the uh, United States, but we have over 300 publications uh, internationally. We uh, own 15 newspapers and 34 dailies. You might recognize some of these. We have uh, over 30 television stations. Each one of these stations have websites and properties. We're also into business to business. We uh, own Fitch Ratings. Uh, we have a lot of automotive-related data companies, and uh, we also have some healthcare-related data companies. And a lot of us, when you think of Hearst, you probably thought in the back of your head a publisher, right? Or a media company. Um, but I actually, uh, I actually view Hearst's 300-plus websites and companies as a data creation company. I believe that our business is around data creation. Um, if you think about your computers and, and all the apps that are powering it, and, and maybe Facebook, for example, if you go back to the early 2000s when it was launched, or 1995, it was just a white page with some blue text, very little in it. Go to Facebook today, type in the word Cosmo or L or any of these publications, and you'll start to see just how much uh, our data actually fuels the Internet. Um, your apps probably tell you how to get dressed in the morning, what the weather will be like, what the school closings will be. That all comes from our editors, from our websites, um, from our newspaper sites that we have all over the world, all over the country. So, um, so Hearst recognized that we're a big data company. And we have a lot of properties with a lot of data. And they're all creating data, and that's fueling the internet. So what do we do about it? So uh, four years ago, we created a group called the Hearst Data Services Team, which I manage. Um, we came up with the name Data Services because we feel that uh, it's not just data science. It's not just data collection. It's actually providing data as a service for the organization. Uh, my team is focused on unifying the petabytes of data that Hearst creates developing a platform by which we can then redistribute that data to the business and then promote product development on that, on that platform. So what I wanted to share with you today, we've talked a lot about Kinesis and the fire hose. I'm going to share, walk you through a product development initiative that we've done at Hearst and the data pipeline which was required to fuel to the engine for that product and show you each of the different AWS resources that we use to build it. So when you leave here, I hopefully you'll feel confident that you can also build products in a pipeline in your organization. So I have a demo here to show you that uh, is of a product that our editors at Hearst use. And I think if we can, we're going to do a little side uh, thing here where this is actually a, a, a view of our product. How many of you have used uh, Yahoo's web page, for example, the home page for Yahoo? That's a curated news feed. So Hearst has over 300 websites. With over th we have thousands of editors around the world producing content. And we wanted to create a product that would allow the editors to see and curate our own content and feed it back to the editors in a platform where they could sort the content uh, on a scale that was determined by our data scientists, a special numeric metric that's valuable to us. We can sort all of our content to find out what's the most popular piece of content, find out what it's trending on in real time, and then you can actually click on that content. And if you're an L editor and you see a Cosmo content, you can republish that on top of your L site. You can take a piece of content that is trending and repurpose it very quickly onto your website and exponentially grow the page views and the interest on that piece of content. So it's basically a recirculation engine that connects the whole company and allows the company to redistribute content across our, our 300 websites that generate over 350 million uniques a month. Um, so as you can see, it's a pretty functional UI. It's actually, in my opinion, my, my wife actually likes it better than Yahoo because uh, it has all the really juicy stuff on it. Uh, but I'm going to switch back to the, to the uh, presentation now. So what happened was is the uh, business development group came to me 
the data services team, and said, we want to build this. This does, did not exist. And I said, I'm an engineer, and I said, well, I need to convert this object into engineering requirements. Oh, before I get there, the, this product itself has already at Hearst grown our page. We have 20, million, 20 billion page views a year. We've increased our page views by 25% by taking our, our best content and distributing. We've grown our visitor count by 15%. And we have a lot of visitors, 350 million a month already. So just creating a piece of, just creating a product that connects the business and is empowered by a data engine can really accelerate the growth of your company if you're, a, if you're a distributed company like ours is. So the product team came to me and said, hey, Rick, we got to build this. You got to connect, we got to connect the editors across the world. I said, wait a minute, what are the requirements? What are the engineering requirements? And so we sat down and they have this, these were the goals, the requirements they came up with. They have a throughput goal. Number one, we have to be able to feed all 350 websites internationally across the world into this tool. We have a latency goal of under five minutes. That means when somebody publishes an article and it starts generating clicks, within five minutes, I want that editor to see what's going on. Uh, we need to have an agile interface, so uh, the, the, the front end has to be very flexible. You have to be able to control the metrics, so I need this data engine to be very flexible. So you can create a whole bunch of new metrics. Uh, I got to create some unique metrics because the data science guys have these very advanced uh, models that they use to create that special metric on the left side of the stream. And it's, a, it's actually a very massive formula. And so I need to be able to plug into this process data science, which if you're familiar with your data science teams, that's not easy to do in, in, in a rapid environment. Uh, we have reporting windows, so the, the tool needs to be able to tell you, me what's happened in the last hour, the last week, the last day, and the last week. So it has to have ability to look at windows of time. The editor wants to look at their article and the performance of that article in the last week, for example. And uh, it has to have a very flexible environment because the UI guys are constantly tweaking the tool, and so I need to be able to have the endpoint of my uh, data pipeline be very flexible to add variables and metrics. Finally, you got to build this thing, Rick, without interrupting the business as it is today. So kind of like flying a plane and changing the engines without landing. So what did I have to start with? I had, I had a, uh, this is what I had to work with. We have, and this may be familiar to you, we had Adobe on our websites, Omniture. Uh, we had it on a few websites. And Adobe would send us data, uh, clickstream data, in a data dump. And it would go to our Natiza cluster. And uh, I could write, my team could write some SQL on it. And we would put together PowerPoint presentations and deliver it to the, to the businesses. Does that sound kind of familiar to your, if you're doing any business today, you've probably used that model before. So that's not, a, that's not a rapid product environment, is it? So how do I go from this to what I need to do? And that's where you know, we, we started our journey with AWS. I'm going to walk through the data pipeline, which is the engine behind this, and how the data pipeline evolved. And it evolved in stages. It wasn't just built beginning to end all at once. It was built in stages. And if you're trying to build a data pipeline, I highly recommend you follow this rollout yourself uh, because it, it, you can't just do it all at once. There's too many steps. So the first step in building a data pipeline is you've got to first start at the very beginning. You have to start with ingest. You have to collect the data. And this took a lot of effort. And the reason, that's why you start with it first. Um, we had to be able to collect data, from our throughput goal, from all 350 websites. How do I get data streaming from all 350 websites? And uh, that's where I met Kinesis. So um, the first thing I did, before I could even play with Kinesis, 
is I had to control the JavaScript on the websites. I had to get access to it because I couldn't interrupt the engineers on those websites. So I installed a tag manager. I don't know, are you familiar with the tag manager? Anybody? Okay. So your website has a bunch of little JavaScript pieces on it that are called tags that transmit data away. Uh, so what we did is we created a bucket, a tag manager, which is a bucket where you put all the tags. And a tag manager is more than a tag management system. It's actually, a, it actually gains access to the websites uh, where you have a console, a centralized console, where you can distribute JavaScript and uh, data or code to all of the websites that have the tag manager object on it. So I first built a, I first introduced a tag management solution to Hearst put all of our tags into it and created a centralized platform. We use a company called Insighton. And uh, that gave me access to the websites. What I was then able to do is I was then able to work with AWS partners to create, to put some JavaScript on all the websites that allowed us to put data into the Kinesis stream. So I transmitted all the data to a, uh, a beanstalk, elastic beanstalk, and then that, at the time, placed the data onto the Kinesis stream. So I was able to distribute code to all the websites and actually finally load data into the Kinesis stream. And at the time, we used a KCL library to offload it into S3. You can now use Firehose. It's a lot easier. But essentially, all I did, collect all the data from the websites and dump it into, into storage. Nothing else. Full stop. Start collecting the data. Make sure that you have all the websites lined up and you're streaming the data into storage and rest. <laughs> so that's a lot of work. A um, Couple of tips here. JSON formatting is uh, extremely valuable. Uh, as you go down the stream, it gives you maximum flexibility, especially when you're dealing with Redshift and with the constant adding and subtracting of new variables. We're constantly adding new variables into the Kinesis stream. So luckily, we built a JSON format, which doesn't break the process as you go downstream. Um, uh, we use some very uh, elastic uh, infrastructures that allows us to scale up and down very easily um, as we uh, grew our websites as the rollout came out. And also use S3 to dump your data and store it. So once you have a reliable process in place for collecting the data, you want to focus on ETL. Why ETL? The data scientists downstream and the products downstream, processes downstream need clean data, or they can be more efficient if the data is clean. And the data off streaming, a lot of streaming data is not very clean. And it could use a little ETL, a little love. Um, so what we did is we created a Hadoop cluster using EMR and pulled the data off of the S3 buckets into, into small, uh, into five minute buckets and cleaned it. We wrote like 50 UDFs, user defined functions, because pig needs some help. Uh, and that was our original process and we noticed that that was running a little slow. Uh, so then we were introduced to Spark, which uh, Adi mentioned. Uh, that's more of a memory. It's, it keeps the data in memory. It doesn't require you to write it to the uh, HDFS environment, and you can do your processing in memory and faster. The problem with Spark was Scala. How many of you guys know Scala? Oh, wow. Awesome. That's good. Zero guys on my team knew Scala. So, <laughs> uh, luckily, we had a Java guy that we mutated a little bit. Um, so anyway, we took the pig script and it was a little time consuming, but it's not that hard. We converted all the UDFs into Scala and uh, we're able to actually convert our ETL, which it is still being done today, in a, in a Spark environment. And that's running very robustly uh, and uh, it's a very fast and powerful environment. So now the data has been cleaned, ETL is done. Now I bring in my data science team. So I have data engineering under me and I have data science. Two different animals. So I think it's important to, you know, 
provide clean data to your data scientists so that they can really focus on the algorithms and not on the data cleaning. If you're a data scientist, you, you know what I'm talking about. So after the Spark stage, we have clean data that's been slightly aggregated. We at the time had a SAS data scientist that uses SAS, if you're familiar with SAS, and um, had it on a single node. And, and he would pull the data down off S3, process it in SAS, and then push it back to, to the, to the uh, cloud in a folder into, a, into an S3 bucket called processed. And in the processing, he would add his e excellent new variables that everybody uses downstream. Problem with this is uh, downloading the data to a single node and doing all the data science took like five minutes, which broke my latency throughput requirements. So I had to come up with another solution for this. So this is a solution that we came up with, which I think is kind of uh, neat and elegant. We, st we still use SAS because that's what my team uses. Uh, and your data science team might use a different tool like R or whatever. But we will still build the models at a, every three hours. The, the program pulls down the data and rebuilds the regression models or the, the different models that they're using to create these special metrics. And then what they'll do is they'll put the coefficients into S3, the model results. We then introduce Redshift into the mix. And what Redshift does is it's super fast at ingesting lots of data from S3 and processing. And so our Redshift cluster pulls the data in from S3 and also pulls the model coefficients in. And it creates the, it creates the predicted values in S3 and then shoves that process data back into S3. And by doing it that way, we were able to accelerate it to 100 seconds. So we still have this, the regression and the, and the modeling being done down here, but we're using S3 as kind of a storage department for our models. So finally, to feed the, the UI, we had to build an API. All UI developers need, a, need an API to hit and call. And so uh, we made the decision at the time to use the Elasticsearch uh, because it, out of the box, an Amazon app Elasticsearch has an API endpoints already built in. So you spin up an Elasticsearch cluster and you stream your data into, a, into an index, you have an API at the front end that's nice and convenient. So what we ended up doing is processing all the data in Redshift and then dumping it into, uh, it makes it API ready, nice and clean, and dumps it into uh, Elastic. This is our full data pipeline now. So imagine ironing it out. This is what it looks like. Um, you have all the data coming in through the front door, uh, being stuck onto the Kinesis stream, and it streams into Spark. ETL is being done in Spark. Models, uh, the fire hose feeds it into S3. Uh, models are built, and uh, Redshift comes into play, grabs the data out of S3, and funnels it into Elastic. This whole process, we start off with 100 gigabytes a day coming in the front door, comes out to be the little API endpoints have about a, a gigabyte or a megabyte, a gigabyte. And uh, the whole process takes about 105 seconds, 135 seconds. That's on full load. Click to endpoint, 135 seconds. Uh, this is just a quick picture of like uh, visualization. So Kinesis basically is a bulldozer shoving uh, big data rock into the, into the pipeline. Uh, Apache Spark is breaking that rock apart and making it into more useful granular pieces. Amazon Redshift scoops up uh, day, hour, and week collections of those gravel rocks and smashes it down to create a diamond. And the diamond is the endpoint's uh, uh, exit value. So that's quick visualization. So does that sound doable? So here's a, here's a quick lessons learned. Uh, so if you decide to do this yourself, um, ways that we found to accelerate our process, um, the top line, you'll notice every step of the way, I offloaded data into S3. Very important thing to do because you never know which of your processes are gonna break 
or as you learn how to use EMR, or you learn how to use Spark, just make sure everything's being offloaded into S3 so you have persistent storage. And then you can try new things, new systems to grab the data from S3. So we tried Hadoop and we timed it against Spark. And when Spark won, we turned off our Hadoop cluster, but we had them running in parallel for a while. And as you can see, we have a lot of S3 offloads. And by removing, as we've streamlined our system, we simply removed S3 offload steps and tried to get straight feeds from one step to the another. Uh, and our today's process sort of has, it really has only one S3 offload. And uh, by doing that, we were able to eliminate a lot of the, a lot of uh, speed, increase the speed. And then finally, our future, we're actually looking at um, possibly combining the redshift and the, the, the state of science step and the uh, ETL into one environment if we can. Um, we're also playing around with AWS Lambda, which is kind of cool. More of a trigger-based method to get, through the, uh, to get through the pipeline. So that'll be at the reInvent, maybe. Um, so now you're probably asking, so how, how many engineers do you have on your team? Rick, how did you do this? How much did you spend? Um, I'm gonna share with you how many, this is basically how much I used and how many people I used to build this. So I really did this with three people on my team to begin with. And I think to keep it running, I actually only need one person today. I did it with some AWS ProServe support. Um, I think you could probably build a data pipeline. If, if your organization is anywhere near eye size, I think you could really do it with two to three people. Or if you can find a unicorn who can do everything, kind of tough because there's lots of different uh, tool sets that are needed. Uh, and we, just to give you an idea, if I were to build this myself with uh, old school infrastructure, with buying all the equipment and hiring engineers to manage and host all that, we came up with a cost at Hearst that the data warehouse would require about $5 million. Um, and I think uh, today we can do this in under a million. And this is for Hearst, where we have two petabytes of data. So that's pretty substantial cost savings, and I can build this with uh, just a handful of engineers um, because uh, AWS allows me the opportunity to um, you know, utilize their services to kind of act as an engineering department for me. Um, so with that, I have, we have seven minutes uh, left to <clears throat> maybe answer some questions uh, if you have about the development or Kinesis. Yes, I'm gonna have to repeat your, we're gonna have to repeat your question unless you wanna come to the microphone. So how much time did it take to build the app or the, or the UI? Ah, so we had, a, it was parallel, so it was done in parallel. The, once the design was made, the UI guys had built it, they, they, uh, they built the framework, the wireframe, and they built it within a couple of months, the, 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 um, the uh, UI itself, which didn't have any data. And uh, we had to create the API front end, which we just basically created a static API data. We just put static data into it and made an API. We did that within a couple of weeks. And it was, the, the UI guy was building all of his stuff off of a static data set. And then, and that's a good, good practice because the problem is he kept changing his requirements on what he needed for the API to do. And there's a lot of little sub tables that are needed, so we, had to constantly tweak that before we fully automated it. So I highly recommend you wait till the UI person is done before you automate. So, yes, in the back. Um, it's come up a few times. We've got a non-current version of it on GitHub called Kinesolite. Uh, but I think we have a lot of work ahead to bring it up to par. 
uh, with our current kind of API version set? Uh, so the short answer is yes, but I don't have a core ETA on it. But we're hearing it a whole lot more now than we did even a year ago. Next question, yes. Uh, in front of Kinesis, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. the question was, can you use API Gateway as a proxy in front of Kinesis? And the answer is yes. Actually, it's, we see a lot of use cases for it now, a lot more. Yeah, we, we actually funneled the data originally, not into Elasticsearch, but into Dynamo, and put an API Gateway in front of Dynamo. Uh, but we needed a little bit of more of the capability to search for text and everything, so we, went to the, we switched to Elasticsearch for more search capabilities. Yes. Um, so I'm going to try and replay the question. Yeah. This was about reducing latency from put to get within a single region, and more specifically, within a single zone in a single region. So how, how can we do that? Uh, so I'll make a statement, and then I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question. So, the, uh, so when we think about replication across availability zones, and for those of you who don't know, it's just different data centers, physically different data centers, but still part of the same region. So US East is one of our bigger regions. US East one, to be precise. Um, the, today, the replication is just enabled by default. It is just kind of part of our design, because it's part of our, as you pointed out, reliability and durability play, uh, which we honestly optimize for because not losing the data and not, have, not making it accessible for us would be uh, a, bigger kind of, a, a bigger diminishing of customer trust than getting it out sooner. So that was our guiding principle. Having said that, uh, we are thinking about reducing put-to-get latencies. Put-to-get latencies right now uh, should be on a TP99 basis in the 300 millisecond route. Uh, customers have reported faster uh, without doing anything specific about availability zones or, or kind of fussing about in that region. Uh, I think we will continue to drive that slower, uh, sorry, continue to drive that down and make those end-to-end -end latencies even lesser. Uh, we have some things in the pipeline, but just to be, you know, right now though, we haven't thought of Kinesis streams as being a single digit millisecond end-to-end latency platform just yet. We're still thinking that we'll play in the dozens of millisecond space for now, uh, but based on this kind of feedback, we'll go ahead and try to optimize on that front. Yeah, why don't you go there? Yeah. What data is still hosted at Hearst? How do you make data What data is still hosted at well, so I kind of view as the data that is in Amazon is a hosted at Hearst as well, because we have a virtual private cloud, and uh, and also all of the S3, we put everything in S3 is is Hearst's S3. So I kind of view it as hosted. At, it's not hosted at Hearst. It's hosted in Amazon, but it's, you know, we have multi-factor and all the other protections that um, that you can have. Um, so I would say. You know, like I said, we kind of built the enterprise-wide platform on top of the existing ones. So, a lot of the, a lot of the current, the old infrastructure of Hearst is slowly moving into Amazon. We have a very big relationship with Amazon, but it's not all in Amazon's yet. I'd say all of my data from the enterprise-wide standpoint is in the cloud, uh, but there's probably still, you know, 50% still in uh, the data centers at Hearst. You have to be able to build both. I think as you build, as you move your company into the cloud, there's going to be an overlap where you're going to be kind of 
halfway. Um, hope that answers your question. Yes, one more. Yeah, so he asked, uh, do we consider any other formats for the data to go into, into Kinesis other than JSON? Uh, yeah, we did. And at first we had it in, uh, we had it in a TSV format, you know, because our guys could read it into Redshift. But then, you know, you kind of have to develop with Amazon. Then Amazon announced in Redshift that they could read in JSON. Whoa, that was great. Uh, and that allows you to point at, you, you don't have to always look for the same data sets, you could say, I only want these variables. And so JSON helps the data scientists downstream so that their Redshift programs don't break because it's always looking at, it can grab a subset of the variables. Uh, and we've kind of stopped at JSON because it seems to be working for us. And you have to think about the whole pipeline. Uh, I think we're out of time, but maybe we can take just one, one more, more question. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, I was just curious about like monitoring the whole pipeline. Yep. Do you really use CloudWatch or yep. do you do another thing? Uh, CloudWatch, uh, we have actually my uh, software SDEs uh, and actually my sysadmin. Well, we, we actually installed little, uh, we have a little uh, template that we look at every day on a, on a huddle that looks at actually the endpoints, the, the actual throughput data, and monitors what's, what's in Elasticsearch. And there's little warnings that go off if the Elasticsearch values start to change after a certain amount. And then we kind of back into the stream and try to figure out what happened. Um, but um, you know, just monitoring the end of the stream, if you have a data pipeline, and monitoring the end of the pipeline has been very effective at helping us you know, identify when something's off or broken, and then we, we use CloudWatch and other tools to try to figure out, kind of go through the pipeline. Um, okay. All right, well, right. thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you.